Today in the Philippines, we mark the 515th day of community quarantine, the longest in the world. That means more than 500 days of literally surviving vague, confusing variants of physical distancing, roadblocks that have made a maze out of the streets, restrictions to bear, and thresholds to overcome. We've lost loved ones to government neglect and fascist opportunism. Every day, in the prison of a neglectful and corrupt regime, is a test not only of our resilience, but also of our creative capacities to continue struggling for a just, sustainable, and democratic future. For us creative workers, the time that has passed has been a practice of constant reflection. Many of us lost income and opportunities, and still others face the threat of obsolescence. In the face of such reflections, We've also witnessed a renewal of investing in things that matter. The pandemic and its accompanying economic and social collapse exposed, if not aggravated, the crumbling system that we've been forced to bear. I'm sure many of you have somehow experienced the same within your communities and households. I like to think of this time as one of moving back to basics, of going back to having old-school secret face-to-face gatherings, talking to our neighbors, caring for each other, and reconnecting with our immediate communities on the most basic human level. Days after the lockdown, I found myself among a community of creative worker activists who themselves face both health and political vulnerabilities, organizing food relief for marginal members of our community. We started off by collecting and redistributing nutritious food staples for urban and rural poor communities who were already facing hunger long before the pandemic disrupted their already precarious lives. Eventually, we move on to the preparation of healthy and nutritious meals for daily wage service workers and food producers whose livelihoods were affected by the closure of establishments, workplaces, and transportation networks. In the midst of an ailing health system, overburdened hospitals, dwindling health workforce, insufficient health services, and scarcity of disinfectants, medical supplies, and even of basic medicines, we all instinctively turned to food. Food became not just our first line of defense against illness, but also a primary expression of care and support for each other, friends, families, and communities we cared for. Today, I will cook one of those meals that is also a source of comfort, arroz caldo or chicken rice porridge, made of rice, cooking onions, ginger, garlic, and chicken stock. Arroz caldo is a popular staple enjoyed by households of varying economic capacities. To the poor, it is an ingenious way of stretching limited quantities of rice to stave off hunger. To the relatively comfortable, the simple flavors of onion, Ginger, garlic, and chicken are a source not just of nutrition, but also of comfort for replenishing anxious, uncertain, and vulnerable bodies. The Philippines, like other countries in the Southeast Asian region, is a rice-producing and rice-eating country. Rice is our staple. In prehistoric times, it was a status symbol of wealth and productivity. Despite being one of the top producers of rice in the region, our country is increasingly becoming a leading importer of rice. In 2018, Duterte passed the Rice Liberalization Law that lifts importation restrictions on uncooked rice grains in a move to solve a supposedly growing food crisis. According to the state's economic managers, the importation of rice is more economically viable than boosting the local rice industry. The unfettered importation of rice has driven farm gate prices for rice down to 7 pesos or less than 20 US dollar cents per kilo, while driving the market price for rice up to over 1 dollar per kilo. This means rice producers cannot even afford the rice they grow. Our livestock producers also suffered enormous deficits at the height of the pandemic, with a drastic decrease in the production of livestock and poultry. Instead of providing production subsidies, the Duterte regime took to importing meat products. For chicken meat alone, importation rose to 18%. And as developed economies pursued protective measures to ensure self-sufficiency, ours practically surrendered food security to corporate profiteering.
2020, the Philippines recorded the highest number of people experiencing involuntary hunger. With 6 out of 10 families or 15 million families without adequate access to food. This figure surpassed the already high rates of number experienced in the previous years, which is exponentially higher than the 9.3% of hungry families reported in 2019. Under the longest pandemic-related lockdown in the world, with nothing to show for but repressive restrictive policies against people's participation, widespread unemployment, inadequate public health measures and social protection measures, this figure the record-breaking number of hunger doesn't come as any surprise. It didn't take long enough for us to realize that the decades pre-pandemic was nothing but a dress rehearsal for the crisis or the so-called new normal that awaited us. The Philippines has already been wrestling with food insecurity for decades. According to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, the number of moderately and severely food insecure people in the Philippines rose from 44.9 million during the period of 2014 to 2016 to 55 million from the period of 2017 to 2019. As expected, Daily wage earners, poor people, farmers, agricultural workers, and fisher folk are the first to experience the burden of food insecurity. To them, to whom food is already a daily struggle, the issue of food is a battlefield. The tragedy and irony of hungry food producers have been depicted countless times. And yet, under the pandemic, this seems that this is what stands for what governments like to call the new normal. Colonial land grabs may have begun in the 16th century, but they haven't stopped since then. After Spanish colonialism set up the Hacienda system, U.S. colonialism established a plantation system by the end of the 19th century, enabling corporations to partake of land monopoly in the Philippines. And in spite of nominal independence from U.S. colonial rule beginning 1946, plantations have only continued to flourish. Currently, plantations cover almost 1 million hectares of land, with over 800,000 in Mindanao alone. They number the 1.2 million hectares subjected to agrarian agribusiness venture agreements in which agrarian reform beneficiaries are coerced into surrendering the control of their land to agri-corporations. Agribusiness Venture Agreements, or AVAS, are nothing but legalized forms of land grabbing rolled out by the government and endorsed by the World Bank to find land distribution even as it withholds lands to peasants who deserve them. 
because the current land reform program does not guarantee production subsidies to beneficiaries and beneficiaries are unable to fulfill amortization contracts. They are forced into leasing their land to deceptive corporations or enter into growership contracts. Farmers tricked into avas end up losing control over their land and their labor. Since corporations are driven by profit, farmlands are held hostage to the production of high-value export crops rather than food staples. As if barring them from the production of food staples were not enough, corporations also underpay agri-workers while withholding their benefits and job security. The lowest daily wage recorded in the Duterte regime was 18 U.S. cents, 18 U.S. dollar cents in 2017. Our food producers suffer from slave wages and the loss of food sovereignty. When farmers lose their land to corporations, they lose their right to make decisions on what gets sown in the land grabbed from them. It is this lack of food sovereignty that ties agricultural land to the irrational whims of the market and puts domestic food security at risk. Subjected to AVAs, the government is eyeing to expand plantations to 1.6 million hectares more, it's converting farmland that yield rice, corn, vegetables, and other food staples into corporate paradises for high value crops. In total, 20% of arable land in the Philippines is held hostage to corporate control of giant transnational companies such as Syngenta, Dole, and Del Monte. That accounts for 2.8 million or one-fifth of land that can feed millions on the wasted production of Cavendish banana, pineapples, oil palm, rubber, cacao, sugar cane, to meet the demands for food and toiletries and clean energy of rich countries. Agri-corporations not only hold immense power and influence in shaping national and international policies on agriculture, food, and trade, they also control the technology needed to grow food, from the privatization of seeds to the mass introduction of hazardous chemicals in corporate farms and plantations. These corporations have compromised both the agricultural land such that agricultural land has become dependent on hazardous chemical inputs at the expense of agricultural work workers' health and welfare. In a 2018 study conducted by the National Federation of Agricultural Workers in the Philippines, the widespread use of toxic agrochemicals has been observed in export crop plantations. Some of these chemicals have already been banned in the production in the rest of the world. Among them are Syngenta's Dacon Kale 720, Bayer's Endosulfan, and Do Dupont's Florsban. In his book, People's Green New Deal, author Max Isle brings forward radical reforms in agriculture as inevitables for planning and instituting an overhaul to the world's food systems. His analysis of political economy of industrial agriculture resonates the Philippine peasant movement's struggle for land, food, and justice. 
the call to dismantle corporate agribusinesses and redistribution of land so that countries have total control over the food import and export trade echo the agricultural workers' call for genuine agrarian reform. From 2002 to 2017, land yielding high value crops expanded dramatically. No wonder 6 out of 10 families went hungry in 2020. Less than 25% meet the recommended energy intake and over 30% of children below 5 are stunted. According to the Federation of Agricultural Workers or UMA, despite our ability to grow our own food, we import it. And despite importing our own food, we export raw materials and high-value crops. Living in the midst of the global pandemic has forced us to face the structural flaws of our food system and urgent need to overhaul our food systems and our culture. Hunger is not bound to go away anytime in the near future. Not if radical reforms in agriculture and economic development are not aggressively undertaken. We need to resist the normalization of hunger and for our own survival, resist the corporate capture of our food system, our land, and our people's labor. Let us stand alongside our food producers who struggle every day to reverse anti-people and repressive policies, to dismantle plantations, and struggle for genuine agrarian reform. Distribute land to the tailors now. <laughs>